the other side of our evening and the other side of John Perry Barlow is that he is one of the leading philosophers and uh, shaman and uh, journalists, teachers of the cybernetic revolution. And just as for thousands of years throughout our history and the last few years in our lifetime, there has been a, a group of us moving up the West Trail to talk about going within. Now, in the late 20th century, there's a group of us that uh, are involved in the cybernetic communication. So in the last few months, John Perry Barlow, Mel Seals, uh, Terrence McKenna and I have met not just as psychedelic, shamanic, inward explorers, but uh, as members of the new community called cyberpunks or cybernauts. People are learning how to use electrons, computer screens, television screens, not for the corporation or for the government or an institution, for the personal growth and interpersonal communication. So uh, John Barlow is certainly entitled to be called psychedelic and cybernetic in his magic. Barlow yeah. comes from a rock and roll tradition, and I've been a groupie and a fan of the Grateful Dead and rock and roll people, so uh, we decided we'd make this thing tonight a, a stand in. Take the, uh, take the guitar, uh, John, and give us a riff. <laughs> Does this to me. He was he was right with you, by the way. You should listen to him. I mean, I. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, all right. Okay. <laughs> He's got the right idea, actually. No, I mean, I, and I hope I hope that everybody here who doesn't have this idea is is looking as hard as he is, and I hope most of you are be a little more successful. <laughs> but never, never discourage the search. Anyway, uh, I wanted to, while I was listening to Terrence talk earlier, I had, a, I had 150,000 ideas, but one of, the, one of the things that I am very familiar with as a writer, especially somebody who writes with music, is the utter inadequacy of language to communicate anything of value. I mean, it's as though somebody gave you the opportunity to make a full working model of a fog bank and the plans and everything else, and then told you to use bricks to build it with. Words are bad materials for the flow of reality that you saw up here earlier when you saw the Mandelbrot set being animated on the screen. That's the way it comes together, and that's the way it feels like it. There's nothing in language that can prepare you for that, but the thing itself. Now we have the opportunity to communicate with the thing itself instead of talking about things. In a very short period of time, going to the combination of virtual reality, which is the ability to be present in the immaterial, and, to, and present where you can't be, I mean, present as an insect. Or that, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and uh, to have your mind inhabit spaces that have never been physically inhabited and never will be, like the surface of, this, of the Mandelbrot set, which is actually a multidimensional environment. You'll be able to fly around in there very shortly. It isn't possible to talk about this, but it's now possible to share it. And that's what we're on the margin of right now. And then that, and that, and that, let me, let me finish this. Well, at least. Germany, German has a great heckling quality. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of amazing to me that you guys ever went for authoritarian government with hecklers like this. <laughs> I'll bet you don't do it again. <laughs> but I don't actually think the government has much of a chance. I think the government is already in the process of disappearing fairly rapidly. 
And being replaced with I'm not sure what, but I'm sure in favor of it. Whatever it is. And uh, it, it all has to do with the ability finally to communicate as we really are with the presence of the thing itself. And to be in community. In the United States, you know, one of the things you folks do have going for you that I hope you don't lose is the sense of place that you get in a place like Heidelberg. In the United States, we almost have no sense of place, which has driven us to find community in all kinds of new ways, like deadheads, for example, who have no place at all. But they wander around patiently behind the Grateful Dead, and when they arrive, they are home. Home is everywhere. But if you actually happen to have one, it's a nice thing to hang on to. And so is the community of those people who live in it. And if you can hang on to it, or if you want an alternative, I mean, I live in a little town in Wyoming of a thousand people. And I'm there about a third of the time, and a third of the time I'm here on the road, and a third of the time I'm in cyberspace, sitting in Wyoming, but on the net, and talking, getting hundreds of email messages a day, and actually finding it in an interest in responding to them, very feeling the net sort of glisten and dance. I push back and it pulls me. And this is this is an experience which all of us are going to have a lot of the time, and I just I, I commend it to you all. But one thing you will find in that experience is community. You will find without liberated from place and economics and race and prejudice. Since nobody has a body in there, you can't tell what they are or whatever they make themselves to be. I don't like that song that much. <laughs> it's still the right idea. You want to make an Alabama in cyberspace, you can do that too. <laughs> anyway, don't forget to keep a Heidelberg in cyberspace because this is a truly magical. I honestly believe, without hyperbole, that the people in this room are doing things which will change the world more than anything since the capture of fire, in terms of what it is to be a human being. When I first started to put my head into cyberspace, uh, it was not as familiar to me as it is to a lot of folks who are now getting into that area, because it had a lot of the characteristics that still remain culturally in my odd little part of the world. And I could see that a number of things were going to go on in there, one of which, if history was to be any guide, was that after uh, a very free society had developed naturally in a very free place, uh, then another society would come and try to make money off of it and in the course of trying to make money off of it would impose an awful lot of control. There has been a lot of unfortunate talk about the national information infrastructure being uh, a data superhighway. This is largely an artifact of the fact that, that Al Gore's father was instrumental in creating the interstate highway system. And uh, it's no mistake that Al Gore likes that metaphor. But in fact, what has been going on lately reminds me a lot more of the development of the railroad in this country. Uh, it is not a data superhighway so much as the data railroad system that we seem to be developing. And there is a cautionary tale in there because the folks, you know, Jay Gould and his, and his fellow uh, barbarians who, who created the railway system in the West uh, knew that if they owned the roadbed and the area around it, they also essentially owned the society that was going to develop there because they could tear up whatever products were created in that society on the basis of their own whim. And the West today is still trying to get out from underneath the, the burden of regulation and, and legal standardization that, that was created in those early days by the railroad. It was almost impossible for farmers in the upper Midwest to make a living uh, for a while, even though the, the Northern Pacific Railroad had asked them to come in there and settle for nothing and had given them land, as soon as they got established on that land, they were they were charged usurious rates for transporting their their market their product to market. And uh, I think 
we can, if we look at the history of the railroad, we can see exactly what kind of, of damage occurs when you give too many people or too few people control over too much of the economy. Actually, I, I really think that it's, it's far more useful to look at the development of the internet in biological rather than structural terms. The internet, to me, seems very much like a life form. It has, it has all those characteristics. It is uh, self-organizing, it adapts itself readily into the possibility space that it finds. It is, uh, it is being created in an interactive way uh, out at the margins rather in the center than in the center. Uh, I've heard Unix describe as a virus from outer space. And actually, it, it, it's more, it's very much like a virus, I think, but it's more a virus from inner space, the space inside the cerebral cavities of many of the people in this room. I want you to listen very carefully to this, this quote by Franz Kafka. You need not leave your room. Remain sitting at your table and listen. You need not even listen. Simply wait. You need not even wait. Just learn to become quiet and still and solitary. The world will freely offer itself to you. Unmasked, it has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. Now, so what I think I'll do is tell a story, and I'm actually just going to grab one I'm going to grab the first one that comes into my head. Ah, that's interesting. <laughs> okay, uh, back when I was uh, in the process of giving up what I'd been doing, which was being a cattle rancher in Wyoming, and becoming what I became, which was, <laughs> I don't know what to call it yet, uh, an internet guru, I guess. So they don't even call it that, that anymore. I was driving back and forth between Wyoming and California maybe 20 times a year. My wife called it the Memorized Nevada Project. <laughs> and I kept trying to find other ways to cross the Great Divide Basin. And I was exploring one of those other ways on a September night late in September evening, late in the, in the afternoon and late in September, and it was cold. And I was driving through a place called Fallen, Nevada. And Fallen, Nevada is notable mostly for being the place where the, the Miramar Naval Air Station kids do their top gun training because they can rage around at very high rates of speed and not do much except break jackrabbit eardrums. And uh, there was a guy who looked like hell sitting on the edge of town, uh, had a sign that said, uh, anywhere but here. And I'm thinking, well, you know, he probably doesn't mean Eureka, Austin, or Ely. He probably means Salt Lake City, which is about 700 miles away. So if I take this fellow on, I'm going to have him all night. But I take him on. And... He gets in the car and he looks even worse than he did by the road and he smells a lot worse and and uh, but I, a weird feeling of peace comes over me as soon as he gets in the car and I feel perfectly okay about having him there and we start talking and it turns out that he was born the day before I was literally the day before I was in uh, uh, kind of a tough part of Queens and he'd gone off to Vietnam, and he'd been shot up and messed up. 
and had come back with a psych psychological disability and a physical disability and had been more or less making it in New York City. He had a, he had a cab driver's license and he actually was a good enough saxophone player so that he played session gigs. And he had an apartment, and he had a girlfriend, he had a functional life, he was a little odd, but things had been working for him. And at one point, his landlord quit giving him hot water to his apartment. And since he was a little bit sideways, uh, he, uh, he quit paying rent, <laughs> thinking that that was, that was not the right thing to do. Uh, so he comes home one night, and his door has been padlocked three different ways. All of his stuff is gone. His girlfriend is nowhere to be found. Uh, his hack license was inside. His saxophone was inside. And moreover, the landlord, in a particular fit of ugliness, is, has informed the Veterans Administration that he's dead. And he has no identification. And in that moment, he falls down through the cracks. And this had happened a couple of years before I met him. And I said, so you're homeless? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what are you doing out here? And he says, just because I'm homeless doesn't mean I can't take a vacation. <laughs> Solid point. I said, I said, well, why didn't you just stay in San Francisco? And he said, I, I don't know how to be homeless in San Francisco. I know how to be homeless in New York. But then it was hard to argue. And we talked about things. And I found him to be lucid and interesting. And... and in Austin, Nevada, I stopped for gas, and it was one of those sort of Baghdad Cafe kind of gas stations with the tumbleweeds and everything. And I got up out of the car, went in to pay for the gas, and I saw my passenger get out of the car and uh, scribble something on a piece of paper and put it in the coin return slot of what was, they still had phone booths in those days, kind of quaint now, but, uh, put it in the coin return slot of the phone booth, out in the corner of the... And uh, so I took a pass by there and I grabbed it up and it was a little note that said, love forgives everything. And I got back in the car and drove for a while and I said, uh, why did you put that note in the coin return slot there? And he said, well, I figured somebody would be looking for money and get my note instead. <laughs> and I said, yeah, right. <laughs> But what motivated you to write Love Forgives Everything? And he said, well, it does. And I said, well, it's a, that's a tall bar for it. But yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, but this means, you know, this seems like a prayer or something. Uh, did you have a very religious sense of things? And he said, oh, yeah. And I said, so you have a very personal God? He said, yep. And I said, well, you'll pardon me, your personal God that you're serving in this very humble way seems to be treating you like shit. <laughs> Whereas I am doing okay. And I don't have this. And he said, well, you know, every soul comes into the world to take a curriculum. And some of us are taking basket weaving and some of us are taking astrophysics 406. And I'm pleased to be taking the harder courses. Which... Next time you find yourself in trouble is something to think about because there's this weird notion of karma that is precisely the opposite of that. Uh, and I think he's actually closer to being on to something. But I didn't think about it a lot until some years later, uh, and I'll cut quickly. Some years later, I fell in love like they do in the movies or operas. And I was in deliriously, insanely, dangerously in love for a year until one night, Two days before her 30th birthday, I put, on, put her on an airplane in, in L.A., and she died on the way to New York, just dropped dead, completely surprisingly. Um, she'd been having premonitions that I was going to die, so she was sort of right. And suddenly I felt like I was taking harder courses, and I had to go through this period of thinking that this was just like harsh, meaningless, horrible manifestation of all the rattling and banging of senseless chaos, or it actually meant something and it happened to me for a reason, and I decided that it had happened to me for a reason. What was that? And I thought, well, if it happens to me for a reason, it means that there is a soul. 
If the soul comes into the world, the hitchhiker was right. I have one, she had one. But why would the soul come into the world? What would be the point of that? And suddenly it became very clear to me that the reason the soul comes into the world is so that love will make sense, so that love will have a context, so that love will have the frame of fear and doubt and decay and the Republican Party <laughs> and nuclear weapons and, you know, the terrible inner self-loathing that each of us carries around for no good reason, which is my idea of original sin. And that we are all volunteers here, that we come into the world from the other side, which is entirely made of love, where it's all open and couldn't be open into this place of constricture and containment and closure and dogma and terror. And we fight with our hearts in order for love to make sense. And by not giving up and by not thinking the worst of ourselves, and mostly to the extent that we're capable of doing it, by learning how to actually accept love from other people, we win that battle for every soul born and unborn. And that is why we were here.